Welcome to this sample audio clip, which comes from the series entitled multi hall Conversations with Jim Brown. In this excerpt, Jim interviews longtime prowess sailor and cruiser Lou McGregor. Here Lou talks about how he got attracted to proas as a type of sailing vessel in the first place, and in the complete audio, Jim and Lou share details about these boats that aren't readily available elsewhere. Both Lou and Jim share from their proa sailing experiences, and Lou recalls some of his favorite memories of the boat, which he'd named Simba, as he traveled with his family to places such as the Intercoastal Waterway and Caribbean Islands. This time we're speaking with Lou McGregor, who is the former longtime owner of the Flying Proa Simba. Hello there, Lou. Hi there, Jim. How are you tonight? Okay, we should explain to our our uh, subscribers that uh, you and I are are longtime friends. Uh, we met when I guess uh, you and our two sons were contemporaries back in the early 1970s. Maybe before that, huh? Yeah, mid '60s, I think. My gosh, yeah, in uh, in uh, San Diego, California. We might have come to the uh, the Redwood Canyon where where you guys built Scrimshaw. Oh yeah, uh, I don't actually remember that, but you know, I hear stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> I remember a photograph of. You and Steve and Russ at the San Diego Zoo. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> All of us exhausted from the heat. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. And um, and uh, it was uh, on that trip, you and, uh, and your family started your family cruise there uh, at about the same time that we left California, and uh, we knocked along together. Um, down the western seaboard, um, and I guess it was at that time that uh, Russell was just beginning his first experiments with proas. But where was it that you came into the fold, Lou? How did that happen? Uh, let's see. The first time I saw Russell's first boat was in St. Croix, uh, was when I was first on Jezero in St. Croix in uh, probably 1976, uh, thereabouts. Yep, and uh, was certainly intrigued uh -huh. I was running a charter boat there and had uh, really gotten into that world. And uh, so Russell's boat just, it just, it felt like another world. Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, these these darn proas. Uh, once you come to understand them, they really grab you <laughs> right at the pit of the pituitary. <laughs> it yeah. seems to become fascinated with the concept. And that we boat were was so skinny and so small. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, we were speaking <clears throat> the other day with uh, John Harris who has a, a proa now that he calls Madness. It's very much the same size as the original Jezero. Mm -hmm. It's very yachty by comparison, but very much the same size, probably about the same slenderness ratio, extremely narrow, mm. but uh, beautifully built. Uh, Jezero was thrown together by a kid for a rock-bottom dollar. Yeah, maximum results per dollar. <laughs> yeah, uh, let's see if you if you encountered him there in 76, I think it must have been 78 when uh when uh I went to the Caribbean as part of that trade winds race mm -hmm. and um uh saw well I hadn't seen Russell for some time and I was aboard of uh no, I guess it was 79. I was aboard 
um, uh, the, the, the big the big catamaran. No, um, Peter Spronk's Checha was his okay. sixty foot catamaran. I think I was in in Checha at that time, and uh, here we were racing, and uh, <laughs> I hear this this voice, you know, hey Dad, and I looked over, and here's Russell loping along right beside us. Um, I was in a boat that at the time had probably cost, I, I guess, at least at that time, two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand dollars, mm-hmm. and um, and uh, uh, Russell didn't finish that race, although he did show up at the finish, and uh, he was awarded what they called the knots per dollar prize. Oh, good. And it's it, it's that aspect of pros that I, I'd like to explore with you. You. You really made a tremendous success, a uh, long-time ownership of that boat, uh, Simba, which was – tell us about Simba. Well, it was uh, t- about 25 years for me, uh, counting the uh, the building process. So it was a long – it was a long time. Um, At- so the boat uh, would be, I guess the way I like to think of Russell's boats are that uh, each one has has been the, the same in their basic approach, but it feels as though each boat is completely different in every way. So she was u- unique uh, compared to his other boats. As you know, as far as I could tell, that he would uh, has just completely thought over every detail. Uh, you know, not doing anything by rote, but continuing to come up with the same basic elements. Uh, so I felt like uh, she was building on his two previous boats. Uh, Primarily, was he thirty-seven feet, Lou? Thirty-eight, uh-huh. uh, noticeably heavier than uh, Kari, the thirty-seven footer that preceded it. Um, I, it seemed as though uh, he was being tentative, building one of these boats for another person, really erring on the safe side, and so. Uh, she came up. She came out rather strong and uh, and a little heavier, noticeably heavier. Uh, yeah. What what other differences? Oh gosh, you you could go on forever. Uh, different in every way. But uh, I guess what stands out um, a. Uh, Cold molded main hull instead of hard shine plywood. Oh, that's uh, right. You guys cold molded that thing. Yeah, and he took advantage of the end to end symmetrical possibility by building a half mold so that you could take two identical panels, flop them around, and and you've got a hull. And then he also used the bilge of the main hull as a mold for solid fiberglass panels for the AMA, for the little hull. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. That yep. AMA was solid glass. Yes. I'll yeah, be. Yeah, pretty low I tech, that, uh, that part. Um, he was trying to save some money and felt like that was a, a part of the boat where you could um, afford a little weight out there, so... Um, and did you uh, did you cast those glass panels off of the completed hull or off of the mold? Uh, let's see. I believe they were. Oh, they were done on the hull. I think the the hull panel was on the mold. Ah, uh, I see. Ah, uh, yeah. Just using it as a mold surface on the flat. Gosh, I don't think I ever knew that about Simba, Lou. Uh, so Did much you have innovation, uh, Jim? Good grief! Pardon? So much innovation. Uh huh. Did Did you have a water ballast tank in that ama? Yes. 
Yes, and uh, of course there was talk about uh, a pump system, but was never hooked up. The boat was um, a little heavier out there, and also the uh, that hull was set farther out uh, proportionally than Kari. I can't uh-huh. say for sure about Jezero, but um, so uh, we often, in fact, usually did not put water in that tank, uh, uh-huh. but did did do it, so, you know, on several occasions, and uh-huh. certainly effective, as you know. Uh-huh. And uh, how about the pod? Was uh, did you cold mold that, or was it sheet material? Uh, that was uh, tortured plywood. Let's uh-huh. see, yeah, tortured plywood. I, th- I believe we um, put additional veneers. We, we beefed up the lee uh, cabin side, let's call it, of the pond. Yeah. Uh huh. But um, yeah, ex- exterior stringers underneath, and uh, yeah, sheet plywood. Well, um, I, I I think maybe. The the uh, the listener may be confused about the term pod. Um, John Harris tried to describe it, but um, what it really is is a large protuberance that that uh, extends outboard on the downwind side of the proa. Here we have a proa that uh, is a single outrigger canoe, and the wind is kept always coming over the single outrigger side, and the other side, the downwind side, has this protuberance which offers a great deal of buoyancy only when the boat is knocked down onto its lee side. And at that point, uh, the buoyancy of the pod comes into play big time. But uh, um, uh, at other times, the uh, the pod is is the the space inside for the um, a big part of the accommodation, the double bunk is out there in the pod. But you used... Um, as I remember, you cruised both with your wife and your daughter. Where where did Lydia sleep? 